Hello, this is attorney Augustus Corbett coming to you again with some legal analysis. This time I'm going to give you a short legal analysis of the legal problems that are facing Antonio Brown of the uh, um, New England Patriots. I hesitated a little bit because I'm actually a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan for many, many, many years. And so in my mind, I was just thinking about the fact that uh, Mr. Brown used to be on our team and gave us some fabulous years and caught some fabulous balls over the years. Uh, but he began to, I guess, not want to be in Pittsburgh. And so we ended up getting rid of him. And then, of course, he ended up in Oakland. And finally, he landed in, at the New England Patriots. Okay. And um, so, unfortunately, he also landed in some legal hot water. Um, and I want to just talk about it very briefly. Somebody asked me on my YouTube channel if I would uh, make a few comments about the legal problems that he's facing. And, and um, so I'm going to do so. So first of all, let's talk about the allegations. Mr. Brown has been sued by Brittany Taylor, a former trainer of his, and she alleges that he sexually assaulted her on three different occasions. In June 2017, she alleged that he exposed himself and kissed her without her consent. She alleged that that occurred in Pennsylvania. And by the way, all of these are allegations, okay? Uh, none of them have been proven true, so just keep in mind these are allegations. But again, in June 2017, she alleged that he exposed himself and kissed her without her consent in the state of, of, Philly, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. Later in June 2017, she alleged that he positioned himself behind her, masturbated, and ejaculated on her back. This, she alleged, occurred in Florida. And then in February 2018, she alleged that he forcibly raped her also in Florida. And by the way, I have the federal complaint here that she filed um, in, this, in this case. So she alleged those three things and, and she sued him on the basis of those three things and a couple, couple of other things. Now, one of the questions that's been circulating around is, why did she file her case in federal court and not state court? Why did she file it in federal court, not state court? Well, let me explain something to you as best, as quickly as possible and as best as I can, seeing that some of this is kind of complicated, so I'm gonna reduce it as much as I can so that um, lay people can understand it. So first of all, to get a case in federal court, the federal court must have what we call original jurisdiction. That means that the federal court must have authority to hear and decide the case. And there are two ways federal courts have original jurisdiction. Number one, if the case or the dispute involves a federal question or if it involves federal law. If, if, if it involves federal law, then that federal court, um, a federal court would have, could have um, original jurisdiction, okay? Original jurisdiction means that it's not appellate jurisdiction. They're not hearing something that was appealed from another court but the case actually originated in that particular federal court. That's what I mean by original jurisdiction. All right, so one, the first way to get a case in federal court is if the dispute involves federal law. The other way is if there is what we call diversity of jurisdiction. And that means the plaintiff or plaintiffs and the defendant or defendants are from different states. Okay, so in this case, Miss um, Taylor is a resident of Tennessee and Mr. Brown is a resident of Florida. So that meets the first requirement of diversity of, of, uh, of jurisdiction. The second is where the controversy exceeds $75,000. So Diversity of jurisdiction requires two things, that the plaintiffs or plaintiff 
and the defendant or defendants are from different states or residents of different states, and what they're fighting over uh, exceeds $75,000, okay? Must exceed $75,000, which brings me to another question that people had, and some of the news commentators were getting this all wrong, and that is some folks were saying that she's only suing him for $75,000. That is not what is going on here. She mentioned $75,000 in her lawsuit because again, she must show that the amount in controversy it exceeds $75,000. She must allege that in her pleadings so that the case can be heard by a federal court. It doesn't mean that she is limiting her lawsuit to $75,000. She could uh, end up getting nothing or she could end up getting millions. Um, the, just saying that it exceeds $75,000 once again does not limit what she's able to get. It just puts the court on notice that this case meets the requirement of having diversity in that the plaintiff and defendant are from different states and the amount in controversy exceeds $75,000, okay? Now, why a federal court in Florida and why not a federal court in Pennsylvania or a federal court in some other state or some other area? Well, because of a concept we call venue. Venue. Venue in this case is proper in Florida because the alleged acts occurred in Florida. So that's why it's in a federal court in Florida because Ms. Taylor's alleging that the events that brought about her lawsuit occurred in Florida. Now, another question that folks have been asking is, why have there not been any criminal charges? Why have there not been any criminal charges? Well, uh, from what I'm seeing here, she alleged three events occurred. Now, from reading her complaint, the first event occurred in, the alleged event occurred in Pennsylvania in June 2017, and she alleged that he exposed himself and kissed her without consent. Now, I looked up the statute of limitations for that type of offense in the state of Pennsylvania, and from best as I can tell, I'm not licensed in Pennsylvania, I could be wrong about this, a Pennsylvania lawyer uh, could correct me here, but from what I can tell, this type of offense, alleged offense of exposing oneself, carries a two-year statute of limitations. And since this allegedly occurred in June 2017, and she filed her lawsuit, as best as I can tell, on September 10th, 2019, that exceeds the two-year statute of limitations for the first allegation of exposing himself and kissing her without her consent. Now, according to her complaint, the last two allegations occurred, the last two alleged incidents occurred in one in, also in June 2017, and this is when she alleged that he masturbated and ejaculated on her back um, if, uh, if that alleged event uh, occurred in June 2017, once again, um, that is about a two year, a little bit over two years at this point when she filed the lawsuit. But this allegedly occurred in Florida and um, Florida's uh, statute of limitations for this, I believe would exceed two years. So if I'm right about that, I believe it is eight years. Um, and if I'm right about that, then he still could be charged in Florida for the second alleged incident. Now the third incident, the rape incident, the alleged rape incident, uh, she said occurred in February 2018. So that's a little bit, um, well, that's going on two years, not quite two years. 
And from what I can tell, the statute of limitations in Florida is eight years. I also saw in one place where it was 10 years. So, so from what I can tell, it's between eight um, uh, or, or 10 years. And once again, I'm not licensed in Florida, so I don't know this off the top of my head. I know this off the top of my head with respect to Texas law, where I practice and I'm licensed, but not for Florida. But I don't think that whether, even if it was two years, which I highly doubt that there's a statute of limitations for two years, um, but even if it was, the, the alleged rape incident would still be within that two year period. So it is possible that Mr. Brown could be charged with um, these things criminally the, the last two things, the alleged incident that occurred in 2017 where he masturbated and ejaculated on her back, that he may could be charged with depending on, depending on the level of charge this is and depending on Florida statute of limitations. The rape, the alleged a rape that occurred in February 2018, he could definitely be charged with that. Um, because that is less than two years. And from what I can tell, once again, the statute of limitations for what they call sexual battery in Florida is eight or 10 years. I believe it's eight, but it could be 10 years. It used to be four years and they amended it to eight years from based on my research. So criminal charges still could come, but let me tell you this. Um, I think it might be a bit difficult to bring criminal charges this this late because with uh, with with the rape situation um, with with uh, with rape, you know there is the need for the evidence, rape kits, and all of that, and um, so without that sort of evidence, assuming that she didn't go to the police, it could be very difficult for the Florida authorities to bring a rape charge against Mr. Brown at this point. I don't know, okay? I don't know the facts, I don't know the situation. I'm just saying, okay, it could very well be. But always remember, and that's the conclusion of the things that I have to say, just always remember that these are allegations against Mr. Brown. Ms. Taylor has to prove her case if they don't settle, and she has to prove them since it's a civil case, by a preponderance of the evidence. Okay, it's not that beyond a reasonable doubt, um, like in criminal cases, but it is by a preponderance of the evidence, and that is a lot lower, that's a lot lower standard than the uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. But my point is, until she proves her allegations, he's not been found guilty, and therefore these are alleged, okay? I don't know the facts, I don't know if he did it or didn't do it, I don't know, I'm not even getting anywhere close to that question. I just wanted to give you some information about the legal aspect of this, all right? I hope you got something from this. Once again, this is Attorney Augustus Corbett of Corbett & Corbett LLP here in the city of Dallas.